Hey there, time to continue our exploration of the ethereal plane and the limitless potential of demiplanes and dreamscapes. First we have some definitions to get through, we should hopefully give you a very easy clear picture of how things work. Fair warning, you'll need to grab yourself a tasty beverage, we're about to get deeply nerdy. Also catch the other two episodes in this series that I've presented so far which will give you some of the definitions of the border ethereal and deep ethereal plane that I've been talking about. Crossing over from the normal world and entering the misty matrix of the border ethereal plane, you will see the huge spectacle of the rainbow curtain further beyond. But what direction is that exactly? The truth is, it doesn't have one, and it's always beyond the 300 foot of possible vision an ethereal traveller would have anyway, so it's beyond sight. But it has a conceptual direction. Moving through it just requires thought and will, so some caution is required by travellers of their thoughts. They may want to fly from one side of the world to another, and think, I don't want to have to cover that whole distance at this movement speed. What if I fly further out and come back at another location? And hey presto, to another traveller beside them they will appear to just sink into a dense mist and vanish. The prime material plane is all around you in the border ethereal. You can peer into it, your body can effectively travel through it in a ghostly form that some creatures can see from the other side. You're ethereal, not quite in the world, not quite past beyond it. Like someone who steps into a teleporter in Star Trek, you're in the pattern buffer. All around you, you can see the prime material world in these patterns, and the misty stuff of the border ethereal builds up on these spider webs of pattern like dew collecting on gossamer spider webs in a cool morning. Travelling out of the border is the act of teleportation. Your pattern leaves the border and passes out of this target coordinate system. This is the rainbow curtain, a vast and undulating surface. Your ethereal form is now in the deep ethereal plane and looking back at the transition zone that touches all the other border ethereal realms in the multiverse. You are completely beyond the prime material plane here, no longer sharing space with it in anything but a theoretical fashion, so nothing is really going to reach you here. All you can see of the prime material plane is the rainbow curtain. Within that curtain are all the dreams of the beings on those prime material worlds beyond. Their dream selves project beyond the border ethereal and pass into the rainbow curtain, that vast pattern buffer, and within it they create dreamscapes. Normally these dreamscapes are difficult to locate or access. Some magic allows it, sometimes there are anomalies called ruptures that allow someone on the deep ethereal side of the curtain to look into or even enter a dreamscape. A good example is called Anavari. The prime material world this dreamscape originates from, mysteriously, is a pretty hostile environment that's nothing like the dreamscape coming from it. Whatever being created the dreamscape in the first place is also a mystery. The world has no name, it's safe enough to bypass the dream rupture and enter the border ethereal zone of that world on the other side of the curtain. And there's a barren, lifeless world with red sands and rocks. A traveller who transitions back into reality on that world from the border ethereal will suddenly discover it has no breathable atmosphere and without protection their blood will boil in the vacuum. Back in the deep, looking into the rupture in the rainbow curtain, you will see instead a pleasant land of golden light, stands of pine trees and meadows surrounding crystal clear pools of water, which can be reached by simply willing oneself to pass into the dreamscape. Entering a dreamscape has its own serious dangers and limitations of the traveller's dream form, since that pattern is now comprised of dream stuff. Their physical attributes don't really apply anymore, unless they are exceptionally strong, which lends to their belief they are strong and does provide a bonus to damage and such. Mostly though, their wisdom score is now their base strength, their intelligence is dexterity and so on. Getting seriously harmed in a dreamscape will usually result in a mental shock. A traveller will get ejected out of that place and their real body and mind will suffer a penalty of 1d4 points off their intelligence, slowly recovering those points one per day. However, they may get knocked into a coma or perhaps even so traumatised they go into a catatonic state and may very well suffer permanent memory and ability loss or just roll some death saves and hopefully not die. Inside the ruptured dreamscape of an avari, the traveller will feel the rules of this environment assert themselves. They will feel gravity, heat, smells and vision will extend out to 600 foot range before being totally obscured by a golden mist. Be careful of travelling into that mist, it's not always present on the border of a dreamscape in such a raw state as this, what it is, is dream stuff. Similar to the ethereal mists, the dreamer forms the substance into their dreamscape. 
any traveller who goes too far into the golden dream stuff is in severe risk of fading out of existence and losing their pattern, and they just become more of the dream stuff, missed, gone forever. Perhaps they could be wished back, I don't know. There is no point venturing into the deep mist anyway, and doing so feels very weird. It's okay to warn the player that it feels very bad, not a good idea. Inavari is typical of dreamscapes in that distance and size are completely deceptive. The pools seem small. They have merfolk made of dream stuff. Living creatures created from dreamscapes are known as dreamborn. The pine forest stands have bright green furred monkeys who playfully throw large pine cones. They're not dangerous, but travellers who kill or wound them will see the whole dreamscape transform in response to this aggression though. The sky darkens, it becomes ominous, and suddenly the dreamborn creatures become huge, violent guardians who fight the interlopers. Inside the trees or beneath the surface of the water, suddenly the little stand of trees are a dense forest with towering timber and thick difficult undergrowth, countless brightly coloured birds and other forest dreamborn creatures. There are distant mountains, castles and all sorts of stuff and the pools become vast and deep beyond indication. Massive coral reefs teem with dreamborn fish in the kingdoms of aquatic beings. This is very typical of dreamscapes. I mean, we all dream. You know how these sort of illogical transitions occur, and how each dream seems to have its own set of unpredictable rules. To the dreamborn, it all makes perfect sense, but communicating with these creatures is often pretty futile, and travellers just have to keep a wary eye on what's going on and expect the unexpected. Leaving a dreamscape is about as easy as entering one, but be careful that the way back out is not being closed off behind you. Venture too deep and you may end up in a coma. The heart of Anaviri is Anna's playground, a grassy hill guarded by a slumbering purple dragon of great size. Atop the hill, a more human looking green monkey and the true origin of the dreamscape, known as the Principal, a nine year old girl named Anna. It's easy to tell who the principal of a dreamscape is. When Anna smiles, the sun shines brighter. When she cries, it rains, and so on. Also common to principals, Anna has no idea she is dreaming. She just doesn't really think about that. Her thoughts concern playing with her friend. Raising the topic with her will cause her to pause and consider it, and she will frown, and the situation will suddenly become a whole lot more dangerous and terribly sad. Anna's body rests in a technological stasis chamber in a crater filled with the wreckage of a colonization ship that was forced to crash land on the red lifeless world. By some miracle, she is the sole survivor. Her mature body is badly damaged, leaving her with the permanent mentality of a young girl. And the machines keeping her unnaturally alive, but forever asleep, are also the cause of the dream rupture. It's not a natural dream. Travelers who press Anna for answers will cause her to become upset. After all, she is deeply suppressing trauma of everyone she loves being dead for many years. She may have been playing on this hilltop with her friend George the monkey for centuries. And if she starts to relive that trauma, the dragon will wake up. His name is Grumpy, and he's not pleasant to those who would upset Anna. Killing the girl will also kill the woman in the stasis pod. The dreamscape will instantly collapse and any travellers will be flung back into the ethereal plane in random locations that could be quite distant. They may also be hurled into another person's dreamscape randomly or materialise inside a random existing demiplane. Those who find a way to locate Anna's real body on the red planet can try to revive her and heal her. This also causes the dreamscape to vanish, of course. Considering the damaged mind this dreamscape originated from and the sheer magnitude of how complex the forests and pools really are, it just goes to show that the mind is an amazing thing, capable of far more than one would expect. Every dreamscape is different, while following some of the same basic guidelines. There's always a principle in there somewhere. They really know that they're dreaming. The dreamscape creatures can be just as complex as you or I. The dreamscape conforms to its own quirky rules and the whole place can shift and change dramatically depending on the dreaming principles, mind and emotions. So for many creatures used to the stability of the primaterial plane, it can be even more confusing and dangerous than the mercurial Feywild with its forced conformity to the narratives of a fairy tale, myth or legend. The absolute masters of dreamscapes, navigation, creation and manipulation are none other than the gold dragons. It's lucky that they are noble and good aligned because there is some power in being able to enter the dreams of living creatures. Not only do they get some idea of what's going on in their life, at times 
mostly via symbolic themes that represent their emotions. For example, the surface of pools of water may be dangerous looking if the person is creating the dream from some emotional difficulty. Anxiety may manifest as dream-born creatures losing their teeth or having their hair fall out, running around terrified that they're too late to some important event. The most useful dreamscapes are those replaying memories from the dreamer, the principal, filtering through emotional distortions. Anyway, it can be really confusing for travellers who are easily distracted or disturbed by these nonsensical dreamscape physics, so to speak. The gold dragons are capable of sending messages to the dreamer, the principal, and it's very common for divine beings to do this as well. I'm not sure how some dreamscapes become ruptured, but the chunks of dreamscape stuff that bleed off or drift into the deep ethereal, the so-called dreambergs, soon fade away into nothing within the deep ethereal plane. Everything found in a dreamscape will fade away outside of the curtain, of course. But there's nothing stopping someone hiding a real object of some kind inside a dreamscape. A risky venture, as most dreamscapes only last as long as the creator is actually sleeping and dreaming. It's not 100% that a real object will just pop back out into the deep ethereal when the dreamscape ends. It may be swallowed by the mists and become dream stuff, gone forever. Though my dungeon master common sense tells me that this would never happen to living creatures, bad guys or magical artifacts. Dreamscapes do not bleed into the border ethereal plane as far as I know, but there are some cases of demiplanes that seem suspiciously like some sort of a dreamscape that has become an actual demiplane. So let's talk about the domains of dread, shall we? I know a lot of you are very, very interested in these nightmare realms. Unfortunately, I'm not any more enlightened as to exactly who or what the dark powers are that have the ability to carve off large chunks of the prime material plane and actually physically transport them into the deep ethereal, cutting them off with enormous barriers of mist. In this regard, while effectively the same as many demiplanes, the origin of the domains, including Ravenloft, are quite different from other demiplanes. They almost follow the same method as the chaotic expansion of the abyss, just on a much smaller scale. But really, there's no perfect comparison. The domains of dread are the creations of the dark powers. They have their own rules and limitations. I actually like the fact that the dark powers are unknown. I could speculate on what they could be. Pale Knight, Orcus, the Lady of Pain, the Raven Queen, the dreams of the Draiden. Actually, Pale Knight, looking at past actions of this entity, is a pretty good candidate. But if it was, there would be some lore on it somewhere, and there just isn't any. There is some sort of very ancient pact made by the Drayden that I think concerns them not destabilizing reality and messing with the planes of existence for their own amusement. Perhaps the Domains of Dread is some little sub-clause in the agreement that allows them to do what the Dark Powers do. This is just pure speculation. The Dark Powers are unknown, but what they do is fairly clear. They capture powerful individuals and create a prison environment for them that is largely under the prisoner's control, but they can't escape it. It's a gilded cage. The Dark Powers are collecting these beings as one would cage a songbird or specimens for study. I do recommend picking up the 5th edition sourcebook Van Richten's Guide to Ravenloft. It's more accurately a guide to many of the Domains of Dread, not just Barovia, the home of the vampire lord Strad von Zarovich, and the castle Ravenloft. The title is a little confusing for people perhaps new to the hobby who are not familiar with the quirky way roleplayers name the different campaign settings. So. We call all of the Domains of Dread the Ravenloft setting, meaning a horror game environment in the manner of Barovia and Castle Ravenloft. Clear as mud. But calling the book 5th edition guide to horror domains, while accurate, is not cool enough, I suppose. You can't please everyone. There are a lot of domains. I'll be making videos about them fairly soon. Even a brief overview of them all is much too extensive for this video. So I'll just say that these are all prison demiplanes under the control of the Dark Powers and within each demiplane, the prisoners act like the principles of a dreamscape. They have great power within their cage, but ultimately, they are powerless beyond its confines. Inhabitants of the domains who are not the prisoner of the domain were created for have a different perspective. They generally don't know of what lies beyond the mists. They call the domains the lands of the mists. Each has its own culture, its own quirks and rules. There are many examples provided in the book, but DMs are encouraged to create their own once they grasp the basic idea. The exact number of domains is also a mystery, so there's a total creative freedom to expand on the campaign setting however you please. There's one interesting sidebar concerning the inhabitants' belief in the origins of the mists, and I'll quote, 
The denizens of several domains worship an aloof god known as Ezra, depicted as a vague, vaporous figure. The god is known for her dark, billowing hair and her ability to manipulate the mists. Her holy symbol is a sprig of belladonna atop a silver kite shield. Beyond that, her disparate sects of worshippers view her differently and contradictorily. For some, Ezra is a goodly guardian, while others perceive her as a soul-stealing embodiment of the mists. By the way, most of the travellers who end up being trapped on a, uh, one of these domains is taken by the mists somehow. Ultimately, though, her nature is a mystery. Whether she's a manifestation of the Dark Powers, an aspect of the Plane of Shadows' mysterious Raven Queen, or something else entirely is for you to decide. Whatever the case, Ezra's followers, traditions, alignment, and the domains she grants her clerics vary widely. Collaborate with your players, who will create characters devoted to Ezra to define the gods' role in their domain of origin. So, they do mention the Raven Queen as a teaser here, but it's not really important. Ezra is a belief, a religion, that doesn't require any factual law to go with it. It may be that the clerics are empowered simply by their collective belief, and there is no god. It's not external power, it's internal to the mist's population. In a nutshell, each domain is a story. And in this, they remind me of the Feywild, where instead of a Dark Lord, it's a Fey Lord. The story of that Dark Lord or Fey Lord determines the thematic elements specific to that domain. In the case of the Fey, their domains can sort of travel with them and often blend together. So Cinderella is assisted by seven dwarves in pumpkin minecarts who forge a magical slipper of glass using an enchanted hammer that causes any non-dwarf who uses it to fall into a slight deep slumber and be covered in enchanted thorny vines. <laughs> the Domains of Dread don't blend together at all, but they're not entirely cut off from each other. There is a mention in the book about a breed of ravens who can travel through some of the mists and carry messages from one domain to another, for example, which has all sorts of possibilities. Some individuals can travel through the mists as well, such as the native Vistani culture. There are magical talismans that grant travel and so on. It's really in the hands of the DM, of course. Each new domain is a new adventure set in a thematic environment with notable set encounter areas and always that Dark Lord and their nefarious activities to figure out, avoid if possible, and perpetually seek a way out. In some ways, the parallel dimension of the Shadowfell is like one vast dread domain with less restrictions on travel, but nobody's in charge. There is no consistent thematic elements, it's random role encounters, seeping despair, draining away of life and vitality, trying to avoid the horrific inhabitants and returning to the prime material dimension before the Shadowfell reduces a traveller to one of the place's sad, tragic, horrific victims. Lots to digest in this video, so I'll pause here and give a chance for any questions and inspiration to be asked and discussed below in the community comment section, as entertaining as these videos themselves in many ways. I do read and respond to as many comments as I can. If you have questions about the topic in the video, I will usually find an answer for you if there is one to find. I'm also happy to help with inspiration for your adventures and campaigns. Just keep in mind, I do have to write video scripts as well as read and answer questions, and there's only so many hours in a day, so keep it brief. Unfortunately, I don't have my own ethereal demiplane where I can set the clocks how I please, like some sort of Dragon Ball Z Universe 7 accessed hyperbolic time chamber. <laughs> Anyway, 10 times Earth gravity would murder me. There will be another video in the series on the ethereal plane, probably many more. I'll be continuing into more details on the demiplanes, the magic that creates them and the rules they operate under. Some examples of known demiplanes and my speculations on the populations of the demiplanes, including the Deep Mascari. But for now, thank you for listening. I am AJ Pickett and I'll be back with more for you very soon.